Okay. Well. Anyways, um, <clears throat> so there, it's like an express train, and he's taking along, and they, they, they're just flying along, and they hardly even understand what's going on. Have you guys noticed that feel throughout the Gospel of Mark? Well, finally, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is going to spell it out very clearly, and they're still not going to quite understand it. But we're going to understand it as the readers. Amen? Amen? So there's two big sections here. The first section is from verse 1 to verse 26. And this is an inclusio. Now, we remember an inclusio is a bracket of two scenes highlighting the scene in the middle, right? So it's the feeding of the 4,000, a miracle uh, of healing, and then a scene about the Pharisees in the middle. Interesting. So let's go ahead and start in verse 1. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and he said to them. So first thing, which is interesting, is that large crowds of poor people are following Jesus still. The Pharisees and the Sadducees have done everything they can to like malign him and speak poorly of him, and the crowds just keep getting bigger. Isn't that interesting? And I believe that as we see God continue to move, there will be always people who may say what God does, but people are going to flock to what God's doing. And what's interesting is, like it says in James, not many of you who have been called are of the rich of the world or the wise of the world, but God calls a lot of poor, broken, sick people who he redeems and turns into something greater, right? So these big crowds of, of, of silly, poor, lay people who don't know any better are following Jesus, despite the Pharisees' best attempts to protect the flock from this Amen. horrible magician, right? But they're following. The second thing that's interesting here is that these people who are following Jesus have been with him. And I'll read this next verse here. I have compassion on the multitude because they have continued to meet now three days having nothing to eat. Has anyone ever been to a conference for three days without having any lunch breaks? Mm -hmm. That would kind of suck. I mean, yesterday, like, I was preaching for two hours. I was getting kind of hungry by three o'clock. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, I was, it, it was, I was getting a little hungry. I didn't know. Involuntarily. Involuntary fasts are the best. Though. Yeah, but involuntary fasts are that. the best because it's moving. But these people were so hungry for the word of God and so desirous of Jesus that they followed him out into Timbuktu into the desert and had no food for three days to listen to him to preach despite the fact that the Pharisees and the clergy and the Sanhedrin were all saying don't go don't go don't go it's bad bad man bad man and they're going anyways and that is the type of people I think Jesus is looking for in our generation he's looking for people who are going to go and follow him out into the desert and go without food go without comfort go without sleep for the service of his gospel and that's the kind of people I want to be amen, amen. Those are the kind of people that are going to have the kind of provision like we're going to see here. Right. So he says, I have compassion on the multitude. This is the next thing. Is Jesus, as we're examining like the nature of who, who is Jesus, like we're trying to replicate him. Who is he? Everything he's done, he says the exact same thing two chapters ago, Phoebe 5, that is, I have compassion on them. Jesus was motivated and driven by compassion, Always. not by showmanship. He was always motivated by compassion. And we need to be motivated by compassion in everything. Amen. It's interesting, my gave her testimony a couple weeks ago, and it was, it was just some horrible things happened to her. And Damien said to me afterward, that was motivating for me to go out and to evangelize and to pray. And I hope it should be. Because when we hear those things, we should be motivated to go out. All the ministries of Jesus, deliverance, healing, evangelism, we could be motivated by duty, which, and there's a little bit of truth to that, but we should first be motivated by compassion. Amen. First a love for God and then for the love of the people because there are people dying, broken, hurting, and we need to be motivated by compassion. And we will come to a problem if we get to such a big platform and such a big following that we're more concerned about making YouTube videos or preaching on big platforms than we are about ministering to individuals who are hurting and broken. Amen. Amen. Jesus was motivated by compassion primarily. And he said in verse 3, If I send them away hungry to their own houses, they may faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Which is another interesting thing. They came from afar. These people, there was no, um, they weren't, they weren't driving their hybrid from from Bethesda, from Bethesda out into the desert. They didn't. They, these people weren't. They weren't even. They weren't even in their little carts. You know, like we think back then. Like you think like the little, the little. Um, like the, uh, what do you call this? This is way too much. The the the, the, the people who don't like the what are they called? The, the people with the horse and buggies and the little hats on. What are they called? Mormon. No. The Amish people. The Amish people. Like they're not. They don't. The Amish people. They have the little horse and buggies. These people didn't have a horse and buggy. They weren't riding donkeys. Those were all rich people things. They've walked. They've walked probably 
Okay, I mean, could you imagine walking from here to Salem? <laughs> that's like that's like 40 miles, right? Some of these people could have come. Some of these people could have come 60, 70, 80 miles, oh, walking all the way from Boston to where, out out here in the boondocks. And this is how far they were coming. And he was concerned, rightfully so. I think some of the platform preachers today would be like, "Hey, you know, you you got out here, so it's your job to get yourself back." But Jesus was concerned that they might faint on the way. And they didn't even. This is crazy. I just realized this for the first time. They didn't even say they were hungry. You don't see that happening. No, they weren't the ones asking yeah. or complaining. That's wild. They weren't the ones complaining. But Jesus had a. And this is the thing: is we are sometimes so spiritual that we forget about we forget about material needs. Like if we want to have a revival, we need to have a sustainable revival. I said this to like Alex and Andrew right at the beginning when like they were like staying up until four in the morning doing deliverance. This is like we need to understand that. When we're in revival and we're having these crazy manifestations happen, we need to understand we're still in our body and we need to take care of our bodies. We need to take care of other people's bodies and not drive, drive, drive until we drop dead and burn out. Jesus was concerned that they might faint on the way. So when we when we are doing ministry, we need to understand that and be ministers to people's bodies and physical needs as well. That's why we started taking clothes out on homeless outreach and we started doing some of these things like that. We're not necessarily going to do that every time, but when we have clothes, we'll take them out. And that was a great opening. But we want to minister to people's physical needs as well. And if we want to have sustained revival, we need to understand it. Yes. That's crazy. I was just thinking like, like we have a biblical example here of a church conference. Yes. Right? <laughs> I'm and, sorry. And this, Jesus this is good. and Jesus provided the food for the conference. Yes, that's right. I in my knowledge, I know I don't know one conference where there was free food. Yesterday, well, I, I, uh, I know, but you you know but what I mean. Generally like, speaking, they're, they're gonna they're gonna go to a big platform preachers conference, and they're gonna they are charge on the food to make a little make a little on the side, you know. Yeah. So you go to a plat, you go to a conference today, and there's sometimes we have things like we have to rent, we have to pay for things. So when people charge for fees to come in, it's not always from the devil. But generally speaking, are you charging a fee to make money, or are you charging because you have to? Because Jesus wasn't charging a fee. He was multiplying food so that he could provide food for everyone so they go home. But the point is, we can get so focused on the miracles and on the healing. And as God continues to work in revival, it will be very easy to be focused on that at the expense of physical needs. Mm -hmm. When I was in Hanford, my, my man Danley, who some of you know, Danley and I were at the Mara Varela conference. And we were both leading prayer teams there at the altar. So Danley was trying, so Danley's prayer team comes up to my prayer team and they say, hey, where's our prayer leader? We can't find him. And I'm like, oh, no way. And I went, he's in his car, and he's like, no, I, don't, I can't go right now. I have to pray first. I'm like, no, you don't have to pray first. You need to get out of the car and get over there. He's like, no, no, i gotta, I got to charge up my batteries. I'm like, you better charge up your batteries over there because you're committing dereliction of duty. We have a duty not to get too spiritual and heavenly minded so that we neglect earthly needs. There are earthly needs we need to take care of if we want to follow Christ-like character. Amen? Amen? That's good. That's good. Amen. The disciples answered him. Now, remember... Two chapters ago, these disciples watched him provide for an even larger crowd with less food. Yeah. How can anyone satisfy these people with bread here in this wilderness? So Jesus is like, why don't we feed them? And, and here comes the board of elders. And they're like, listen, pastor, I don't think we're going to be able to afford this in the budget. I just don't see how we're going to do this. And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said they have seven. But it is mind boggling to me. That they witness the same healing miracle and they are so hard hearted that they still don't believe when he's about to do it again. You know, healing miracle? No, the, um, excuse me, multiplication of food miracle. But they saw this miracle already with an even larger crowd and now a smaller crowd and they still will not believe. But how often in our lives do we see Jesus do something, whether it be healing, deliverance, another kind of miracle? And then when he's going to do it again, we have doubts and reservations in our hearts. Mm -hmm. So it's not like these people were such idiots and, and we're so wise because we can read it in the Bible in hindsight. No, we are so often like that. And we need to examine that and realize that that is wrong because our unbelief is much worse when it is unbelief against what God has already shown us in our own life. Mm -hmm. It's one thing when we read it in black and white and it's maybe hard for us to understand because we haven't seen it. But when you've already seen it and you don't believe, that is even worse. So let us not be like that. And unfortunately, many Christians are like that today, where we see God provide in our life, and then we still go into doubt and unbelief. Because we go off of feelings. Because we go off of feelings. When I first came home from California, and I did not have really any stable income for six months, 
I was still paying a mortgage. I was still paying my car bill. I, and every month, like, I had no money. And I'm like, where is it going to come from? Like, and, I, and then all of a sudden, like, a check would come in the mail. And I'd have enough money to pay for all my bills. And then, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm like, yeah. all right. And then, and then I'd run out of money again. I'm like, oh, 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 what am I going to do? It was horrifying. But then, uh, then he would provide again. And he kept doing that. And then until the cleaning business came. And then eventually other sources of income came. But the point was he provided every step of the way. And we need to believe him to provide in our lives. Amen. When the Biden collapse happens, excuse me, Facebook. When the Biden collapse happens, we need to believe that he's going to provide for us. We need to believe that he's going to provide for us whether we have nine laying hands or whether we have none. Whether we have an income or whether we have none. Whether we have a job or whether we have none. If we are serving him and following him, we need to believe that he is going to provide for us. Especially in the tumultuous times that are coming in the future. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. Amen. So he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves, gave thanks, broke them, gave them to the disciples, set them before him, and he set them before the multitude. They also had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he set them before them. So they ate and were filled, and they took up large baskets, seven large basketfuls of fragments left over. That's amazing. Now they had eaten about 4,000, and he sent them away. First thing here is the big contrast we need to see is that what did Jesus do when he was given the seven loaves? What's the first thing he did? Thanks. He gave thanks. thanks. He was thankful for what he had. The disciples were a little, uh, a little bit out there. They didn't quite understand. But sometimes there's a big need in our life and our material goods, our earthly goods are not able to meet that need. And it can be easy for us to complain. It can be easy for us to become discontent when our situation is not exactly what we want it to be. But the godly, correct response is for us to give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God. That's good, that's good. The Israelites had manna coming out of the heavens, oh my. and then they complained. And then God gave them quail, and then they started dying. Thankfulness is so important. Contentment is so important. It is a primary attribute of a Christian that we be thankful and content in everything. Paul said, I have learned to become content in everything and in all things, whether I have much or I have little. Contentment and thankfulness is so essential. It is the kernel of why this healing miracle took place was thankfulness. And Jesus was trying to show them something. God will provide for all of our needs. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be concerned. If we get grumpy and complaining and bitter and upset, then we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to end up starving to death. But when we are thankful in all things, he will provide for us because he is faithful. And our thankfulness is an expression of our trust in him that he is able to do all the things that he has said that he will do. That he is a good father. The Father of lights, from whom every good and perfect gift comes down. That is who he is. Oh, and our amen. thankfulness is an expression amen. of trust in that reality. And our complaining, amen. by contrast, is charging him with being a liar amen. and an unfaithful God who does not do what he promises. Amen. So we don't want to complain. We don't want to be discontent. We all have troubles in life. And I've heard a lot of us in, in church express that, you know, I'm dealing with this and I'm dealing with that. And we do have troubles. I'm not to neglect the fact that our troubles suck sometimes. And you guys have made the joke that, like, Maya said, like, oh, well, I'll tell David how bad I feel, and then he'll tell me some martyr from church history, and I'll feel terrible. But we really <laughs> should put it in perspective yep. that there are people that have suffered way worse than I have. And when I read these stories of these martyrs and these people who suffered for Christ, and their response was, praise God from whom all blessings throw, because I am still greatly blessed, yep. even though I'm being burnt at the stake or marred by lions, even though my children just got killed by the Roman government. That shows Bless the God. that we don't have. Yes, and that is where we need to be. If we want to see miracles like this, that is the level of thanksgiving and gratitude that we have to have. That's right. That we can face down the pack of lions in the Colosseum and say, praise God from whom all blessings both for yes. he has greatly blessed me and he has been good to me. Yes. That is his nature. Our thankfulness and our contentment is an expression of trust in who he is. Amen? And we need that. And we, we have gone for the last century in America, we've been comfortable. And we can, we can get away with a little bit of complaining and we can survive because we're in a first world country. But that time is coming to a close. People in Africa, people in South America who trust in God, they trust in God and they have thankfulness and they have contentment and they have joy and he provides for them every step of the way. And here we are and we have every blessing which can possibly be conceived. There's more wealth in this room than there has been in entire countries throughout most of history. And yet we have complaining and discontent and we need to be thankful and content in all the great blessings that God has given us. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Furthermore, he provided for them. He pro this is a now, this is a real miracle that can happen. Do you guys know that? 
you know, we had, um, I told the story last time I preached on the, on the feeding of the 5,000. We, we had a miracle of provision that happened when we were in Bible study in high school where there was one little tiny box of pasta like this big and we had 30 people and that's not enough to feed it, but we cooked it and there was a giant pot and we got 30 people ate and then we had three large Ziploc bags left over Whoa. and meatballs. Whoa. God can do that. God can still do that. So when we, as we are keeping in mind as things get a little hairy in the future, God can still provide for our needs. We may not have enough chickens or corn or things growing in our yard to be able to provide for all our needs, but God can multiply that. But what did he do? Did Jesus pull man out of heaven? No, he took what was already there and he multiplied it. So we do our due diligence to bring to the table what we have. We're thankful for it, even though it's not enough, and he will make it work. Amen? Amen. And that's what we need to trust and believe that he's able to do that today, just as he was back then. Amen? Because he is a provider. That is his nature. Amen. One of the covenant names of God is Jehovah Jireh. I am the Lord, your provider. Amen. And he will provide all of our needs. He's faithful to do that. Amen? Amen. Good word. Amen. So they all ate and they were satisfied. That's and in amazing. verse 10, immediately, whew, immediately they got into the boat and they came to the region of De Delmutha. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him. Oh, no. So this is the first thing that's interesting here. Is that anyone notice that the Pharisees weren't out in the wilderness? <laughs> that's interesting. The Pharisees didn't go to the revival meeting out in the wilderness because it was inconvenient for them. Mm -hmm. They're back in the city. And as soon as Jesus comes back, here he is. Jesus is out there for three days in the wilderness having a revival. And these clowns come up in their robes. <laughs> and they're, just, they're coming to dispute with him. They're coming to dispute with him. Pharisees do not go out of their way to go to revival. They are not hungry. They are sated with their self-righteousness. They were sated with themselves. So they were not hungry enough to go out into the wilderness and to see what God did. But the poor were the ones who were hungry enough to go out and see what God was doing. Amen? They came up and they began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven and testing him. They missed it. They, they missed, missed it. The sign. <laughs> well, they missed the sign, but you know what's interesting is they say they wanted a sign from heaven because they saw many miracles of oh, Jesus. Yeah. But they say, we want you to like, you know, like call a tornado or a lightning bolt down from heaven or something. This is what's crazy about the Pharisees. Remember, as we've looked in Mark, the big difference is the Pharisees are concerned about the outward appearance and God is concerned about the inward eternity of the heart. So what, are, what all of Jesus' miracles have in common the feeding of the 5,000, 4,000, healing, deliverance. What do they all have in common? There was a need that to provide for. There was a need. They changed people's lives. They impacted people's lives. The Pharisees were looking for a miracle that had absolutely no bearing on anybody. Just a, just, a, just a arbitrary, just show off your power. And there are Christians who try to do things like this, try to do yep. signs and wonders in the sky that are not based in compassion and a need. And whenever we can do a miracle that by a side effect may have helped somebody, yeah. but if our main point is the power of God and not the compassion-driven ministry of Jesus, then we have missed it. Yeah. And there are, there are people throughout church that have done that. They have taken real miracles, turned them into showmanship, and then they lost the anointing. Yeah. Because God's heart is not showmanship. God doesn't need to show off his power. He can evaporate us. He doesn't care what we think. All right? We are, we are a little drop in the bucket. He owns the entire universe, and we are nothing to him. But he has compassion that he would go out of his way, that he would touch the hurting and broken people in humanity. And that is how we ought to approach ministry, not chauvinistically, but compassionately. Yes? I just want to say, like, the point you made was good. And it just made me think, like, how the Pharisees, like, literally could have just gone out to the wilderness to see the miracle. But, like, they were that lazy that they wouldn't, didn't want to watch him preach for that long. We just have like a moment's quick of like... That's right. Something. And they wouldn't even have believed that miracle because right. they saw... Because they, they didn't care. They, even, if he, even if Jesus yeah, summoned a tornado, they yeah. still wouldn't have believed. Because in the Sanhedrin meeting, they said, Look, this man raised this man who has been dead for four days. He's calling all the people out after him. They would never have believed no matter what he did. But the type of miracle they were looking for is the type of miracle that God's not interested in that has no bearing on anybody. Right. God's miracles are those which have bearing on people. And that's what we need to do. So when we are involved in things that have no bearing on individuals around us, those are sorts of things that don't carry as much weight in God's kingdom as those things which bear weight on people's lives and change lives. Because he is in the people changing business. That's what he does is he change hearts. Amen? Amen. Amen. They wanted a cleaner miracle. That's what I wrote in my outline. 
Jesus did not entertain them. Though they wanted it nice and clean, because healing, deliverance, feeding the 5,000, this is all this charismaniac stuff, right? We just want something nice and nice and neat, like, you know, something that looks a little looks a little magical, but not too crazy, right? That's what they want, and that's what people want today in, like, Pentecostal Christianity. They want a clean miracle, something that won't dirty up the carpets like deliverance, something that won't put me in a position of discomfort like healing. You know, they want something nice and clean. Yes? I also just realized when I said a sign from heaven, there's multiple meanings of heaven in the Bible, right? Which made me think of Elijah, the prophet, calling down fire. Yeah. And the other thing about the Pharisees is they want to replicate what God's already done. They mm -hmm. don't want to see anything new. It's like, hey, just, just do right. the Elijah thing. Just, That's right. Just do the Elijah thing where you call down fire, and we'll know, okay, you're mm -hmm. sent from God. That's right. And then actually, in most commentaries, they say that's what they're thinking. Oh, they, wow. We want you to prove you're from God like Elijah. Wow. Elijah was eradicating Baalism from Israel. There was a purpose for that. Yeah. That was not like, let me arbitrarily just, you know, There's the fire. show yeah. off. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Nonsense. He says, why does this generation seek for a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given this generation. Yeah. Because they are obstinate in unbelief. So Jesus did not entertain that nonsense and neither should we. There will be people that you may confront on outreach or people you may even confront in church. And they will say to you, I want you to prove you're from God by giving me a word or by doing this or by doing that or by doing a miracle. <laughs> and sometimes maybe God will have lead you to do that. But generally speaking, I would not, based on this scripture, entertain that nonsense because that is sitting in the seat of the scoffer. And in Proverbs, as one of the Proverbs, there's a reflection of this. It says the opposite, but it says, do not, uh, what's the, what is it? Um, don't I find you. Dad, don't answer a fool according to, to his folly, lest you make him wise in your own eyes. Because he is sitting in the seat of the scoffer, and he's going to have to pay for that. Because God's not pleased with sitting in the seat of the scoffer. Amen? Mm -hmm. And he left them. <clears throat> Amen. Let's go ahead and leave that nonsense. And he left them. Getting into the boat again, he departed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. He charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Mm -hmm. So leaven is an interesting picture because yeast, which is leaven, could just, just put a little, little bit in and it will change the entire chemistry of the dough. And the leaven of religion will sneak in so easily like that. Because it's easy to see. It's easy to see the tassels coming down the street and say, oh, there he is. I know that's the bad guy. It's easy to point outward and see it in someone else. But the reason he's warning them, and by extension us as the church, is because we can be liable to that. We can allow unknowingly religious leaven to come in and make us act like the Pharisees when we begin to look at the outward appearance. When we begin to be concerned with ceremonial things rather than things that change people's hearts. When we begin to be concerned about how other people feel about us. Those are little specks of leaven that if we let come in, they will enroot and then they will, over the long term, grow us into Pharisees. And he says, beware of the leaven of Herod, which is the leaven of politics. Ooh. Which politics can get to the church. Now, we need to be politically active in some sense because we need to guard righteousness in the culture. But... Sometimes people put the, heart, the cart before the horse and then they become political Christians rather than Christians who are politically fighting for righteousness. Right. And th I, I think of like this, uh, you know, this meme, it was like, that I saw it and it said, something my aunt would post on Facebook and it's a picture of like um, Trump, John Wayne and Jesus holding an American flag and like looking up to heaven, like in front of the White House. And it's like, it's like, <laughs> You know, one of those things like middle-aged Republican Christian women would post something like that. And it's funny, but it's true, that some people get so obsessed with the political aspect of things that they almost put that before the gospel. The other thing is sometimes we can start acting like politicians in the church rather than acting like Christians, where we get all political in the church and, you know, our little sectarianisms and we start fighting and bickering and everything. And that is also, I would say, probably a leaven of Herodism. Amen? Amen. So he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have no bread. Now, the Greek here actually says they disputed with one another, which I don't know if anyone's translation say that. But basically what it says in the Greek is that they were arguing with one another. And the syntax would be like, oh, James, it's your fault. You forgot to bring the bread. No, Peter, you, you know, yeah, our fault you did it. No, it was Judas. No, 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 it was John. He did. And they're start. so here Jesus is saying, hey, stay away from this. Phariseeism and so away from the leaven of Herod and they're like start arguing about bread and Jesus is like I just multiplied twice I mean and he says it 
Why do you reason that you have no bread? It's like, what's wrong with you? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still so hardened? And there they are. He starts saying this. He's like, see, John, look, it's your fault. Having eyes to see, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls did you pick up? Uh, Twelve. Uh, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? Seven. And he said, then how is it that you do not understand? How is it that you still do not understand? They think, they, don't you realize I can take that one bread and I can multiply that if we need to? You don't understand. But the problem is that, that like we said in the introduction, they're here on this express train and these disciples do not understand what's going on. And they see him do this miracle, they see him do this miracle, and they're still so hard-hearted and having a difficult time believing. And this is being contrasted with the Pharisees. We look at the Pharisees and we say, oh, the Pharisees are bad. But the disciples are not doing so hot themselves. Because even though they're trying to follow Jesus, they don't understand what's going on yet. And so often, we can fail to perceive what God is doing in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our generation, in our country. We can fail to perceive it because of the hardness of our heart, because of our unbelief, because of our experience. But so often, God will try to speak something to us and we hear him, but we don't understand it. And he says it again, and we hear him, but we don't understand it. And then one day it clicks, and then we get it. And oh. But it wasn't because he was holding out on us. It's because of the hardness of our heart. God, I believe, has been trying to restore the full gospel to the church since the day it was lost. But it took centuries before justification by faith was restored. It took martyrs being burned at the stake before justification by faith was restored. And then that was restored. And then God tried to restore healing and deliverance. And then that didn't work. People didn't understand. And then it, so we're here and we're finally back to the drawing board. And he's restored basically the full gospel and trying to get us to the next stage. But it's usually, it's not, he's not holding out on us. It's because of our hardness of heart. But we can overcome that because that's, because God will help us. He wants us to know. He is a revealer of secrets. He is not a hider of secrets. He wants to reveal his word to us. He wants to reveal himself to us. But we have to open ourselves to him, ask him to help us change our hearts, repair, examine ourselves from sin, from pride, from hardness of heart, unbelief, get rid of that so that we can open ourselves fully to him and receive from him. Amen? Amen. Amen. How do you still not understand? Furthermore, of course, he could provide for them. They weren't even talking about Phariseeism, but they were arguing about it. Like, I mean, and so often that happened in the Gospels where Jesus is saying, I'm about to go to the cross, and then they start arguing about who's the greatest as if that had anything to do with it. But you know, Part of their misconception, which we're going to see in a minute, is they were still thinking that he was a political messiah. And that is basically one of the core misconceptions they have. So they come to Bethesda in verse 22. He came to Beth Bethesda. There's another there's a city in America that has a similar name that I'm screwing it up with. And they brought a blind man to him, and they begged him to touch him. This is interesting. Is The blind man did not come to Jesus himself, but his friends interceded for him and brought him. And this gives us hope because there's some people who are not in a necessarily the best spiritual condition that we would like to see helped by the gospel. But our intercession can bring them to Christ. He didn't come of his own accord, but people brought him and this man gets healed. But that's encouraging that we can, through our prayer, bring people to get healed by Christ. Bring people to the throne room on their behalf. Amen? They, of course, have to be willing. They, of course, have to make the final decision, but that, that can be a major factor. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Which, by the way, where are the Pharisees for this one? And they spat on his eyes, and, on his, and he laid his hands on him and asked him if he saw anything. So this is interesting. Um, Jesus, I, I, I'll, get you, I'll get you in a second, bro. Jesus does something he hasn't done before. He spits on his eyes and lays hands on him. So he does a different method. Interesting. So Jesus didn't heal by route. What I mean by that is he didn't just go one, two, three, four, <laughs> be healed in Jesus' name, be healed in Jesus' name, be healed in Jesus' name. So when we approach healing and deliverance of really anything, we shouldn't go by route. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not big into evangelism scripts is because it gets us to go by route rather than go by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. He went with a different method almost every time he did anything. So maybe there are different methods that are acceptable. That's why when we look at deliverance, we don't see an exact method that he used but he can use whatever method he wants. So if a method works, and in this case, this guy spat in the guy's eyes, Jesus spat in his eyes, and that worked, then let's go by the fruit rather than by the outward appearance and getting all caught up in what method is the right method and, 
and getting all anal about that. Because so often Christians, unfortunately, get really um, uppity about what kind of method you use for healing and deliverance. And they may not like it. So then they don't like the healing and the deliverance because you did it wrong. You don't do it like me. The way I do it is I don't do it at all and I make sure everyone stays in bondage. So that's the right way to do it, right? No. Let's not get caught up in that. So he did it by... Oh, yes, Andrew. Why did they weed him out of town? Excellent question. They let him out of town because he was maintaining the messianic secret. Oh. Which is... This is starts to... The messianic secret is getting breached at this point. So he can't do miracles in front of other people because now it is starting to be problems. He let him out of the town. Some commentators believe it's because Bethesda had so much unbelief. And in Matthew, he says, Woe to you, Bethesda, woe to you, Chorazon, because I did miracles in you. And if I did those in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented, and you didn't. So some say that's why. I don't necessarily see that because that context isn't in Mark. And Mark is talking a lot about the messianic secret. So he leaves him out of town. He asks him if he sees anything. He says, I see men walking like trees. Wow, that's encouraging. Jesus, the Son of God, the divine Son of God, who came out of heaven and prayed for this guy, and he didn't get healed the first time. So how much more do we pray more than once and expect healing? So he prays again. Yeah. He lays his hands on him again, and he made him look up, and his eyes were restored, and he saw everyone clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Again, maintaining the messianic secret. So we see here two incredible miracles bracketed by a scene of unbelief both in the Pharisees and in the disciples. Now, this is in this second scene here is where we're getting into the theological center of Mark, the core. Now, we all know Peter's confession of Christ, or at least I believe everyone in here is somewhat familiar with that, right? Peter's confession yeah. of Christ. That's the Son of God. And we have three scenes here. Now, this is another inclusio. We have the confession. We have Jesus teaching something, and then we have the transfiguration. And all three of these scenes, which I'm not going to get into the transfiguration, we'll get to that next week when we preach on chapter 9, but all three of these scenes, highlighted by the middle, is showing the identity of Christ. And there's two points that Mark wants to get across about the identity of Christ that we need to understand. And we'll get into that here. So, now Jesus and his disciples went to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And he's on the road and asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, others say the prophet. And this is usually what happens is um, everyone has some kind of nice picture of Jesus, but it's not the right picture. And even in Christianity, when we have the theologically right answer, Jesus is the Son of God, we have a skewed perception of who he really is. And a nice perception doesn't mean it's the right perception. Being compared to John the Baptist and Elijah is nice, but it's not accurate because he was greater than them. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. And that's how often people as usually are. They have this skewed, incorrect perception of who Jesus is, and that's the big problem in the world today. But he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him and said, You are the Christ. So let me ask you this. You guys have read this confession. is in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Do you notice there's something missing in this one? It says, you are the Christ. But in the other Gospels, it says something. Son of you are the Christ and the Son of God. What's interesting to me is Mark, like Ms. Damien mentioned at the beginning, oh. is Peter's rendition. Just a second, bro. Peter's rendition of the Gospel, right? Matthew and Luke, I believe, were trying to communicate that theological point. But this is Peter's memory. And I believe... What Peter is recalling here is that he said that you're the Messiah, but he did not understand what the Messiah meant at this time. When he said Messiah, it's the king of the king, the king, the son of David with a sword coming and chopping the Romans' heads off. But they did not understand that he was the Son of God. But Mark says at the beginning, his point is he's trying to make the point that Jesus is the Son of God. He says at the beginning of Mark, he says, Jesus, the Son of God. You know, at the beginning, that's the point he's trying to make. And nobody throughout the entire gospel gets that. There's only two people in the whole gospel that understand who Jesus is, other than the narrator. The demons? Okay. The demons say, oh, you're the son of God, and nobody else gets it. And then the centurion at the crucifixion says, you're the son of God. So a pagan centurion and a bunch of demons yeah. recognize it, but not even the disciples can clearly see it. Yeah. He says, you're the Christ. That's the closest he can get, but he's still <clears throat> missing something. And this is what he's missing. So there's two central hopes of the Old Testament, if you read the prophets. One of them is the Messiah will one day come, 
and deliver us and restore Israel. And the other central hope of the Old Testament, which is the greater of the two, is one day God will come and dwell with us bodily, and the relationship we had in Eden will be restored, and his presence will be with us again. The Old Testament prophets and the apostles, didn't, until after the crucifixion, did not understand that those hopes are combined in the person of Jesus, that he was God who came to dwell bodily with us. They didn't understand that. So the reason I think the other, the other Gospels say this, but Mark doesn't, is because Peter did not understand that Jesus was fulfilling Emmanuel, God with us. He didn't understand that he was the Son of God. He did understand that he was a Messiah, even though he had a skewed perception of what that meant. Does that make sense? So in verse 30, he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He spoke this word openly. This is the true identity of the Messiah, and this is the first point Mark is trying to make. The other point being that he's the Son of God, and we'll see that more in chapter 9, but the point he's trying to make in this part is the nature of the Messiah, and by extension the nature of God, is the suffering servant. He was willing to suffer for us, that he would be rejected, suffer and die for us. And if we are going to replicate him, then we need to be willing to do that as well. But their skewed perception of the Messiah was that he would be this great earthly king, and therefore, if we align ourselves with him, we will be these great, magnificent earthly creatures. And that's not what he says. He spoke this word openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. When he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. This was an earthly perspective, not a heavenly perspective on who Jesus was. The heavenly perspective is backward, that if you want to go up in the kingdom of God, you must become a servant and not exalt yourself. Andrew, did you raise your hand for something? Verse 34, he called the people to himself with his disciples also, and he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him take up his cross, excuse me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? The real call of the gospel and the real call of Jesus, which he exhibited, through the cross and through his life, was that we should lay down our lives for him and become wholly his in everything. And be willing to be walked on. Be willing to be assaulted. Be willing to be, go through uncomfortable positions so that we can be representatives of Christ. That we can serve him and serve others. And to have the high call of discipleship. When he says, deny himself and pick up his cross, we think of the nice little cross necklaces we wear. That would be like saying... Put the little noose around your neck, throw it over your shoulder, and walk after me because as soon as you're following me, you're considering yourself as good as dead because you have been bought with a price. Right. And our lives belong to him. Amen. But we need to act like our lives belong to him and not say it and then live like our lives belong to ourselves. Everything which we own, everything that we have, everything that we are is all his, Amen. and we should be willing to be putting up with everything else. Now, like we said at the beginning with thankfulness and contentment, when Jesus was going through all this, he never complained. He never, he never, he never cursed any of the people who were cursing him. He never right. snuck back. He loved them. Yeah. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what we do. And we need to react the same way when we are in uncomfortable positions. We need to react with contentment and just know that the nature of the gospel is that we would be able to put up with suffering and be joyful that he has blessed us. That doesn't mean we need to live lives of suffering all the time, but that means that whenever circumstances we are in, we are content in knowing that we are in a relationship with God, that he has bought us and that he has saved us. Amen. That's good to Whoever is ashamed of me and my words yeah. in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory with his Father and with the holy angels. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, Sometimes there's a temptation that we water down the gospel or the person of Jesus to accommodate the culture around us. That is being ashamed of him and his words in exchange for this adulterous and sinful generation. Because our generation is 
adulterous, and sinful. Every generation is wicked compared to God's standards, but our generation is especially wicked. Right. And if we try to change the person of Jesus, or change his standards, or change who he is, or change what he's asking of us to fit the buck of what the world wants, that is wrong. When we act the way the world wants us to act, and then slap a Christian label on it, that is being ashamed of him and his words before this generation. We are to call to act in a way that is countercultural, that is against the grain, then a Christian and Christ-like way that will be difficult to do in this adulterous and sinful generation. But if we choose not to be ashamed of him, then that is the way that we will live. We will live by his word. We will live by the way he wants us to live. And we will live by the conviction that he is who he says he is in this generation without being ashamed of him. Wow. Amen? That's a good word. Wow. So what we need to do in light of who Jesus is, is he called us to be like him. In ministry, which much of what we preach through Mark is showing that, that we should be healing the sick, casting out demons, multiplying bread loaves in certain occasions. Yeah. But we need to be who he is, not just do what he did. To be who he was is he was humble and meek yeah. and made himself lowly, though he, being equal with God, considered it not robbery to clothe himself with human flesh, to suffer, to die, to be crucified for us. And he gave that as our example that we would love one another in the same way. And that we would love the world in the same way. Amen. So let us love each other that way. Let us serve each other that way. And let us serve the world around us Amen. in that same way in which he served us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, that would conclude our message for the evening. That's Very it. good. Thank you. Very good. So that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. How long was I?